Hello, everybody. Today we have a very interesting and different interview with a man who I've been speaking about for quite some time now. The man who wrote the Pyramid Code. The man who documented Rays of Light. The man who brought me into the world that I'm in today in regards to TLS, that organization otherwise known as the Light System, who we will be speaking about today. That man, my dear friend, Ray, is sitting right in front of me. Ray, thank you so much for being here and allowing us to have your time. You're welcome. I'd like to first start by asking why it was so hard to get you on camera. And even with that, we had to change your voice and you didn't want to reveal your identity. Well, I'm a very private man. And I don't want to do anything in public. Plus, the nature of my work forces me to hide my identity. When you say the nature of your work, What's interesting about you, and you can touch up on this, is you pretty much live a double life. There's one life in the public of what everybody knows you as, and there's another life having to do with an organization that you work with pretty closely, doing a lot of things behind the scenes. Can you touch up on what that's all about for anybody who doesn't know? Well, yes, it is a double life. Up to 2010, I was living a pretty normal life. And then TLS entered my life. There's someone that I met who slowly, slowly put me through the process. And once you deal with TLS, everything is basically very secretive. You can't, you cannot identify yourself or anybody else from the organization or anybody else except the people in the organization. Can you explain a little bit more about what TLS is and what they do from your firsthand experience of working with them? TLS is an organization that has been in existence now for many, many years, thousands of years, and it's right now there are about 7,000 members worldwide. There are, new, there are chapters, offices, if you want to call them. They call it, they refer to it as chapter instead of offices in basically major cities around the world. There's a manager for every city. And there are managers on top of the managers. They do work that is physical and spiritual at the same time. Some members are doing the spiritual work. Some members are doing the physical and some members sometimes doing both. They're capable of doing both. Can you give some examples of what physical work would look like versus what spiritual work would look like? Physical work would be into somehow going to someone's office, for example. A private office or public office and basically try to grab some paperwork. Important paperwork from his computer from his desk while keeping him busy doing something else and basically taking the material away. You can call it stealing if you want. Spiritual work is more... It's more of a... You can call it mind games, for example. Changing somebody's perception about life. Changing someone's opinion about certain subjects such as politicians and doing spiritual work on them. In most cases, they don't know what you're doing to them. And it all depends on the nature of the mission that you have at any given time. So this could be done in the middle of New York City. It could be done in the mountains in Utah. It could be done anywhere, depending depending on the mission. You have short missions, long missions. What side of the organization would you consider yourself? More on the physical side, more on the spiritual side, or both? I am more spiritual. I'm still spiritual, although sometimes I'll do physical work. But usually it's with other people. Are there any examples you can give of the spiritual side of the work that you've done in the past? No, I can't. I can't talk about that. 
Overall, if you could sort of summarize the intention of TLS as a whole in terms of everything that they do, physical, spiritual, all the operations, what are they aiming for? What's their purpose? That's a good question. I ask myself the same question over and over again, because sometimes I don't even understand the mission that I'm about to do. Sometimes I don't understand what is the target. They're not always telling me. Sometimes I just go, I just go do something, as I'm told, and I get out. Not always do I know what is the purpose, but overall, they are looking to fix things around the universe. It's about helping humanity. Helping... Uh, helping people in need. Helping the world in general. I can tell you, they are a very nonviolent group. And they don't like to use force, although they can. Uh, force is not being used. They like to use, as, as I said before, I call them mind games. Change things. As long as you're allowed. You're not always allowed to change things on your own. Change things through the human spirit. The human mind and so forth. Do you know what the rules are in terms of being allowed to do something and not being allowed to do something? Yeah, but it's very complicated. I don't know if I can even summarize something like this in such a short discussion. You are not allowed to interfere with someone's destiny. In 90% of the cases, that means, for example, it happened to me a lot, that I saw someone in danger and I knew I could help him and I wanted to help him. And I could get him out of the danger zone, so called. And no, they told me no. You leave him alone. He has to go through this. You can't do that. On the other hand, many times it happened when I saw evildoers, I would call them, in my eyes, are criminals who I know. I know what they did. And when I wanted to stop them from doing something or punish them, for what they did, because obviously the police aren't going to do anything. I was not allowed to do that either. And criminals could be an ex-Nazi, or it could be some pedophile. It could be... Things don't make sense to me till today. I don't understand the rules. I try to follow them to the max. I'll be honest with you, and I'll tell you that not always I followed the rules. I didn't break the rules, and I did. I did pay a price for it when I did not follow the rules. When you say you broke the rules, can you elaborate on what that means? I did things that I was not allowed to do within the organization because I thought it was the right thing to do at the time. I believe I have a conflict with the organization where I believe in more action and more Sometimes to even use force when it's necessary. For a good cause, of course. And they are... They are more laid back. They... Force is not... Is not something that they want to be dealing with. And unless they really, really, really... Perceive it as we don't have a choice. Which again, and I have a conflict with it. I have a personal conflict with it. Maybe because I'm not an official member of the community of the organization. So, I don't know everything. They're not telling me everything, which I can understand. But, things don't make sense to me in many, many missions. But I do them anyway. You've told me many times that TLS has wanted to initiate you and you chose not to. Can you elaborate on why you made that choice? I'm still a family man. I'm still member of my community. To become a member will change everything, not only for me, but for my entirely, for my entire family and I. I don't feel ready. My family is definitely not ready. Most of the people who are close to me don't even know what's going on. So yeah, I didn't think, I didn't think it was a proper thing for me to do at the moment. 
especially where I had so many disagreements and conflicts between my way of doing things and their way of doing things. They like to do more of teamwork. I like to operate on my own, and it causes friction within me and my superiors. One question I wanted to ask you in regards to you not necessarily understanding how they call the shots and what the so-called rules are, who does make that decision on what would interfere with somebody's destiny and whatnot? Because you sound more of like a soldier. Yes. Where is the commander? Who is the commander? Is it a human? Is it in a higher realm? How do those things work? Uh, no, it is a human. There was a rabbi that you know about. Rabbi Aleph Aleph, AA we call him. He's one of the main guys. Underneath him, there are many, many managers throughout the world. My direct manager, or boss, or supervisor. Uh, she's someone over here in New York, and I answer to her directly, and I take orders from her directly. And she's making decisions with the help of the rabbi. There are other people like the rabbi. There are humans, but they're, in my eyes, are superhumans. They have natural abilities to do things that me and you cannot even understand. And I've seen, I've seen things with my own eyes that I'm still shocked till today. And, and there's a few more like the rabbi. I don't know how many around the world, but I know there are others. And there are very, very unique people with special supernatural abilities. You know how many people like that still exist on Earth in the 400, 500, 600 year old realm in a physical form? There are others who are older. I know of another guy who was 646 years, if I'm not mistaken. Still alive, still functioning, and... But again, if you see them, you're gonna see a normal person. An old person, not super old, but old. In good shape. That's what you're going to see. You're going to say it's an old man in a good shape, very good shape, as a matter of fact. What kind of abilities have you seen them do that you call incomprehensible to the normal common man? I can't discuss much. I can tell you levitation. They can go underwater for many, many, many hours without breathing and... They, they have the ability to communicate with other ETs, we call them. And they speak many, many languages, including languages of other, other entities in this world, physical entities. We, we call them ETs that are coming from different places in the world, and, and that's all about I can tell you at the moment. Have you ever accessed any of those supernatural abilities, levitation? I was given the ability, well, I was first, I was taught first. And given the ability, uh, it can be taken, it can be taken away from me at any given time. And, yes, but it's for, it's not something you do for fun. You do it for a specific mission. What situation would levitation be necessary? I can't discuss that. But have you used it in an operation in the past? Yes. When it comes to extraterrestrial life that you brought up, I know a lot of people are looking forward to some form of disclosure. And many times there's this idea of false hope. You know, recently the government said there's going to be big disclosure. Nothing really happened. Have you ever had personal experiences with physical extraterrestrial beings? Yes. Can you elaborate on what that means, what your experience was like? What would you like to know? Be more specific. Let's start with TLS. Does TLS and extraterrestrial beings work together? And if so, in what way? Yes, they do. Our people will go to their continent, if you want to call it that. Planet. Planet. Some of them call it continent. I don't know why, but they use the word continent rather than planet, it doesn't make a difference. The meaning is the same, and the people will come here on Earth and become part of society here through training, of course. What would be the purpose of that so-called assimilation? 
They use them for work here, because they have very, very supernatural abilities. Such as, I know it's going to sound weird, but they actually create nuclear power from their hands and legs. There's something within their body that gives them this energy. It's like an eel, you know? He kills his prey by sending 600,000 volts into his brain and he kills him. That's how he kills him. So they have more than 600,000, but it's more like a nuclear power, I would say. They could be extremely dangerous at times to others. How many extraterrestrial races, physically speaking, have you been in contact with through TLS? Well, I don't remember. I would say about five, six. We've spoken in the past and you told me about three. And if I remember off the top of my head, it was Nashia, Tsia, and Konon. Can you speak about those and maybe elaborate on the others you've come in contact with as well? There are others that I cannot mention names. The ones I did mention to you that you just mentioned. And what can I say? And see how they are more human-like. They're just very tall. Can you explain their physical characteristics for Tsia for a moment? They look very tall, Europeans, big bones, and they have their own language. They can also communicate by telepathy, but they do have their own language. All of them have their own language, and very advanced technologically, but very simple life. At their planet, meaning could be they sleep on the floor. They walk barefoot most of the time, unless they need to put protection on their legs for certain reasons. And their clothes are very simple. And what else? Like I said, they're very tall. The men and women, they live much longer than us. And see a very a dry place. As a matter of fact, it's a problem they have now. They're losing a lot of the population due to lack of water. Water is a major problem in the last 100 to 200 years by them. It's hot. They're Europeans who happen to be dark. That means they look like they have a tan all the time and blonde hair. Light color eyes, blue, green, stuff like that. And... The men are hairy, the women are not, and... Do they all look alike for the most part, or is there a diversity? They look like, they look like a family. They all look very similar, European in nature. Are there any other races that live on their planet with them? There are humans who are there. That's part of the... They become like them. You can't, you can't come there and stay with the human body. They train you to change. You gotta know how to eat their food, you gotta slowly, slowly get used to their way of life. Same thing when they come, when they come to Earth, it's the same thing. It's a process, a very long process, and they train them how to... When I was there, I couldn't be there with my own body. They're giving you someone else's body. How they do it, I don't know, but... My body wasn't up there, I was there, but not my body. You've spoken about physical crafts that you've been on. Yes. Can you, can you speak about those in terms of your travel? Well, there's many different crafts. All, all kinds of sizes and shapes. The colors are basically black, silver, and white. Mostly silver. You don't see colors like red and yellow and stuff like that. And like I said, different shapes. Some of them have windows, some of them have digital windows, which is... You think it's a window, but it's really like a TV screen. Very advanced TV screen. Nothing like I've ever seen before. And there's a captain for every ship. And the crew could be anywhere between 3 to 30 people, depending on the size of the craft. And... What are the different sizes you've seen and been on? Well, it can go from a small, the small, I mean, could be the size of a yacht. How, how many feet? 
75, imagine a 75 foot yacht. That's as small as they get, and they could be like two, two or three football fields in size. So the bigger the craft, the more, the more crew members on the craft. When you had the experience of going onto these crafts, first of all, how many experiences have you had on a physical craft, and where do you take off from? You're asking how many times I've been on a flight, that's what you're saying? Yeah, physically with your body. Physically with my body, and my memory serves me right about eight, nine times. Not a lot. Do you have one experience over another that really stood out of what happened on that craft? I can't, I can't discuss the details. That's too much information. What does the inside of the craft generally look like from the ones that you've been on? It's again extremely advanced. Some of them have digital buttons. Some of them have screens. Some have windows. Some have buttons actual physical buttons and they a lot of them are being used with the captain's hands or the captain might hold magnets in his hands and start moving stuff with his hands and i know you could move it physically with the natural energy that it has or you could use your own body energy meaning the power of thought and you can move a spaceship Obviously, I do not know how to do it, but I've seen it done. And I got a few tips from the rabbi. Because every time I went, it was with him, and he was teaching me stuff while... Everything was a learning experience. You don't go because you want to have fun. It's not where you go on vacation somewhere. It's all about a learning experience. Something you need to learn. Grab it deep inside of you and use it in the missions that they're giving you, or other missions in the future. What types of places have you taken off from? Is there something here in New York, New Jersey, Florida? It could be many places. As long as there is a field, it could be done anywhere. Usually they have, they have fields that they use on a regular basis. They don't like to go to new places without being doing their homework at first and doing preparation in advance, but usually it's from one place here in New York, no. But in New Jersey, yes, there's one regular place that I visited a few times and I didn't always fly. I was part of a team that just showed up to the place. But not every time I flew, again, my experience with it is very limited because it wasn't my thing to do. It was a small part. It was more of the beginning when I started, and the last time I was on the spaceship was maybe 2014. I haven't done any since then. When you take off, is it a quick takeoff, something slow, and how does nobody see? First of all, it could be quick, it could be slow, depending on the plan is or what the captain is doing with the ship at the time and there is a magnetic field it's like a shield that surrounds the ship or the entire field that you basically if you're going to be on the road looking on the field you might see fumes but you're not going to see a structure you're not going to see humans you're going to see fumes you're going to think that fumes are coming off the ground it looks like fumes. When you look straight at it, you're going to see... You know when you look on a hot day very far away and you see like fumes coming out of the road? It's like uh, when it's wavy. It's wavy. That is what you're going to see and you're going to think it's, you know, or it could be, it could be uh, on a snowy day. You're going to see the same fumes. But that's what it looks like for a regular person that comes from outside. Usually it's not that exposed. And if somebody ends up being there, usually the security that will stop him somehow from going further. And it did happen. That security not always could get every angle of the field and people went through. But in most cases, they don't see it. And if they see, nobody believes them anyway. Are these fields privately owned or are they public land? In most cases, it's, it's public land. Does the government have any idea that this is going on? All governments know what's going on. They don't know about the details that I'm talking about, but they know. And 
There is communication. There is talk among the people. But yeah, the big politicians, the important politicians, they know what's going on. I don't know to what degree, but they know. Would you say that those big politicians or individuals in the government on a wide level know about, let's say, the existence of TLS as an organization, what they do and how they do it? I don't know if they're aware of the name TLS, but they know there are certain organizations that work in this type of field, yes. And for example, the rabbi, I was, I was a witness to a meeting he had. He didn't come as the rabbi, but he had an actual meeting in Washington with the president at the time. I just don't want to mention the year, but he had meetings. How does he change his ID, his identity, and he meets the president? He can meet people in NASA. I met people from NASA. Certain people from NASA are part of, are part of TLS, important people from NASA. One of them is even mentioned in the book Rays of Light, which is not published yet. There's a whole conversation with him, the operations, work that has done with him that I happen to do with him personally. So yeah, they could be in Hollywood, they could be in NASA, they could be in government. I don't know everybody I, I met with, whoever I met, so I know, but they're all over the place. When it comes to NASA for a second, there are a lot of people that have very controversial opinions because they believe that NASA is on the dark side and lying to us about many things. One thing being the shape of Earth. And there's a whole movement going around right now of this idea of flat Earth. Now being that you have actually been out of Earth's atmosphere with crafts, have you had the opportunity to actually look out of a window and experience the shape itself? And if so, what did you see? Well, first of all, about NASA, NASA is a government agency, so my advice to everyone, don't trust any government agency, including NASA. And I had the privilege of working with someone within NASA, within NASA that happens to be very famous, I'm not going to give his name, very famous, and a great individual who happens to work on the TLS side, but to tell you that NASA is... An agency you could trust? No. I'm sure they're corrupt like every other governmental agencies. I don't trust any of them. I would never trust any of them. And what was the second question? I'm sorry. In terms of the actual shape of Earth, when we had the so-called moon landing, a lot of people say, well, no, it was all fake. It was a Hollywood production. That might be so. I have no idea. But when it comes to the actual shape of Earth, what was your experience if you had the privilege and opportunity of looking out the window on your way out? No, this is the one thing NASA is not lying about. It's not flat. I don't like to use the word conspiracy theories, but it's, it's nonsense. It's not flat and it's not fake. And although many other things within government are, but we're not going to get into it now. The speed at which you left planet Earth, how fast are we talking? I have no clue. I can tell you it's extremely fast, but first of all, for a person like me to be on a spaceship, I can't just walk on a spaceship. I got to drink something in most cases, something that tastes really bad. I don't know what's in there, but I know it's all natural herbs. I don't know where they get them from, but I have to drink before and... Or depending, or depending on the spaceship, or the travel that you're doing, the location you're going to. Sometimes you have to put a suit on to protect your body from the pressure. Is the concoction that you would drink being done to protect you from atmospheric conditions? Yes. And from getting sick. Although this concoction made me nauseous, most of the time, for days after, even when I come back, I was still feeling nauseous for a few days. But eventually, you get used to it. How long would you have to drink it for before the actual spaceship experience? My very, very first time uh, to have this crazy travel, 
I had to drink it for about a month to get my body ready for the travel. And it wasn't pleasant. But I did it, and... It's why there was two flights I remember that I did with the suit. The rest was without. Back to the actual speed at which you left. How were you able to observe planet Earth from the outside if you moved away from it so quickly? What was your experience looking out those windows? So it's very interesting when you... Let's say you're looking through the window so you can feel the speed. And you know you're flying because you feel pressure, certain pressure. In most cases, the captain will tell you to sit. You could stand, but you have to be strapped. They don't have to. I guess they're used to it. They're not strapped. Only the newcomers are being strapped. And looking through a window, you know, you're moving extremely fast. But your perception of it, you're moving very slow. So I see things through the window that's moving extremely slow. How does it happen? I don't know, but they, they're they changing your perception of time. And so again, when you look through a window, it looks like you move very slow, but you know that you're moving very fast. And you're seeing many things throughout. Your flight could take anywhere between 5, 10 minutes to 20, 30, but they don't need a lot of time, to our understanding of time, to get places. What types of dis distances are we speaking here? Millions and billions of light years away. We're talking outside of what we know of the universe. Totally outside. Now those certain things could be done with the physical body. Combination of soul and body. Can you explain what you mean by that? You could do as a human being once you learn the system exactly what the spaceship is doing without the spaceship. With your physical body flying that way yourself. With the physical body, obviously it takes a lot of drinking and training. And... Drinking the concoction. Yes. And... You could do it without your body. They call it out-of-body experience. And you could get to many places very fast. And again, I'm trying to emphasize here what I'm saying. It's not like you're dreaming. You're not dreaming. You're actually doing something and you're getting places. And when you're getting to places and you need a physical body, don't ask me how the rabbi did it. But there was always a body for me to borrow. So I was one of them. We were one of them. In Sia, for example, first time we arrived, I was given a body. The rabbi walked normally. And people knew him, and they greeted him. And you could see the love. Excellent relationship is like, you see, they love him, they admire him. But he walked around like a normal guy from Earth, and he was making fun of me because he saw that it, I, I'm in shock. It was a funny experience. Very interesting experience in Sia. But yeah, I think I spent there. First time I was there, I spent like three days. Three days according to Earth time. Yes. What is that translated into time and how it works on that planet? I can't even begin to explain. It's... I don't know how to explain it. In that three-day period? First of all, they don't have nighttime. It's always sunny. On Sia? On Sia, there are three suns. There are no moons. There's no moon. It's always hot. Always sunny. Sometimes less sunny, sometimes more sunny, but it's always sunny. Are there clouds? Very few. Like I said, they have a rain problem. They have a water problem. You've explained, and I know you can't go too in-depth in details on this one, but in even in Rays of Light, it talks about a funeral that you attended in Sia. Yes. Can you speak about the way that these extraterrestrial beings on Sia perceive death? Is it over here where you wear black and it's sad and everybody's crying, or do they see it differently? No, they see it very differently. For them, it's a celebration to celebrate life. They know that this entity who happens to pass away, if you want to call it like that, is being reincarnated to something else. What? Nobody knows, but for them, it's a celebration of life that this entity is moving to somewhere else. For them, it's always a better place. They see it as a positive, not as a negative move. 
So yeah, so they have a ceremony. Nobody is crying, but they have some, I think it was prayers. And I would say some type of singing, which is very weird to us. But overall, it was a positive experience, not negative. It wasn't sad. There was no sadness. They expressed themselves, they expressed themselves with a lot of love. It's not so much laughing or crying. It's for them, it's love. It's giving love. And you could see it. I saw the way they, they were speaking to the rabbi, and it was a different experience. It's, it's not something you see on earth. Do they bury the body like we do here on earth? Sometimes they bury, sometimes they cremate. Sometimes, if there is a body of water, they let it float on water depending on the way. I think the request of, a dis, of the deceased person and is it like over here how we have families, mother, father, children? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Back to the other two races. We spoke about Sia. There's also Nashia and Konom from our conversations as well. Can you explain more about your experiences with these other extraterrestrial beings? Well, Nashia, for example, they have a lot of fruits that grow there. It's very green. There are no vegetables as opposed in, in Sia, it's more of a vegetable type of food. Needless to say, they're all vegans. They don't eat animals. There are no animals. It's them in nature. So Sia has vegetables. They have more fruits that are very green, very, very large amounts of water. But interestingly enough, their buildings were more advanced, meaning similar to ours, like two, three, some are even four floors. All buildings are in white color. And they live very short lives compared to Sia and compared to us. Can you give an example? If I remember correctly, I think they're, according to our time, is 15 years. Where, where Sia used to be 360 average. 350 to 380 and due to lack of water... And now they're come down to 180 to 200, and most of them die before 180 now. On Sia? On Sia. On Nishia, when you say buildings that are advanced, are there any skyscrapers? No. What would be the tallest building you've seen? Four floors. And what do they do in these buildings? Are they homes, offices? What's the society like? Both. Do they work? They work. What types of jobs are we doing? I don't know, I'm not sure, but it's... They're living a normal life. They are known to have a very, very short memory. They are short people, physically. Very short. Big bones. Dark skin. They have no nose. They have two holes, so they look like humans. But far from being human. They, unlike Sia, where it's like, actually humans to me, yeah, they look, they look like humans, but I cannot define them as humans. And Konam is a totally different world. It's like, I don't even know how to explain it even. First of all, my experience with an entity for, from Konam was in New York. And... He was with his original body and face. What did he look like? This small curled up dolphin. He was very scared, I guess. He just arrived. I was in a specific hotel under a mission. I showed up. Other people were there. My boss was there. And I got close out of curiosity. And for some reason, I wanted to touch him, I guess. Not to harm him, of course, but when I got close to him, and I put my hand, he perceived it as me trying to harm him or attack him. So he attacked me, he almost killed me. How? He shocked the hell out of me. Radiation? I don't know what was that, but it was like a bomb exploded within my body. I was knocked out and they had to work on me in emergency. They injected me with something directly into my heart. Like stabbed me into it. Everything was done very fast. I was like almost gone. And half an hour, an hour later, 
I was picked up by my wife and another friend, a TLS friend, and I was taken to, basically I was, my shirt was bloody from the needle, I guess, and obviously my wife was scared, but I told her everything was okay. I was very weak, and yeah, but by the next morning I was fine. Lots of pain, but I was fine. So I guess they gave me something to help me. I guess he radiated me. That would be the right word. I don't know till today. But he was like a nuclear generator within his body. I happened to learn about him already because we got closer within the years. We got closer. We worked together. I spent time with him. I saw his transformation. He became... Today, he's a regular human. You're going to see him. He has a human name. And he talks. He talks English with an English accent. And it's interesting. He went through the process. He eats our food. And they taught him everything. He dresses with a suit. He looks like a gentleman from England. That's what he looks like today. When you say he changed his form, are we talking like the idea of shape-shifting? No, not in this case. They don't do shape-shifting. Not him, anyway. How does he transform his body? I don't know. It's a process that they do. I was not in the training when they do it to him, but first of all, he has to learn how to eat. And then there's something, I don't know, it's not in my field. But, no, he's not a shapeshifter. No, not in this case. Can you speak about your experiences of the, the holographic forms that they go through? Complicated question. Again, I cannot tell you the process because I was not in the process. Just people I know... Entities I know, and within time, suddenly I see how they change their form, and I meet them the next time, and suddenly you see a human that is transparent. You understand what I mean by transparent? You can see through. Yeah, but you see a human. Can you put your hand through the human? Yes, which is weird, but they talk to you. They talk to you in English. They, they will even drink. How does the water stay in their body? I have no clue, I don't know, but I know the first time I saw it, I was like, wow, I was scared. It's scary, the first time you see those things, even though I was in a big group of people and the rabbi was there, it was like a nice happening that happened to the organization, and, and when I said there were two of them and I saw them, I was like, you know, you go into shock because you say, well, maybe you're on something, and I don't drink, I don't touch anything. I'm very clean all my life, and suddenly you see, you see these people, and yeah, but when you get to know them, you don't pay attention anymore, and eventually they become human-like, like body and bones and skin and whatever. Once they finish the process of that so-called transparent holographic form and become the physical dense form, once again, the new body so-called, Number one, are they taking over a body, or are they changing the form of their own body? I'm not sure, but I think they're changing the form of their own body. But it's the process that takes time. How long? About a year. Understood. And once they go through that year process, are they able to change instantaneously? Yes, they can change into a holographic being. They can change to the original form, because a lot of the times they go visit they go back to their life, their families, back on their planet, or on their continents. So when they go back, they go back with the original body. They don't go as humans. So what would be the difference between that longer form of, I guess we can call it shape-shifting, based on them taking on a new form over a period of time, versus instantaneous shape-shifting? Well, what's the difference between the two processes? Shape-shifting is... Shapeshifting is different. Shapeshifting is done within seconds. Less than a second. Have you seen that done before? Yes. Can you explain what you've seen? I don't do that. That's not... I'm not capable of doing it. Yeah, I know one person who does it in the organization. Again, first time I saw it, I got extremely scared. It was very scary. You don't understand what's going on. But yeah, a human can shapeshift to another human, another animal depending on what is the purpose of the mission and first time it was done to me it was done in a private setting 
in a hotel room and just to show me what's happening is like to teach me, you know, like, don't be scared. This is what's being done. So it was part of showing me the process. But, but still, even though you understand they're telling you what's going on, when it happens the first time, you're like almost collapsing from fear. It's very scary to see the change because it's like a second or two. Are these human beings that are able to shift their form? In this specific case, I'm talking about this specific person, yes. Are there entities, ETs, who can do that? I don't know. I'm sure they can. If humans can do it, I'm sure they can do it. They're much more advanced than us. The instantaneous form that you're speaking of? Yes. But not shape-shifting. It's not something everybody can do. It's not something you can... I can sit and teach you how to do. You will not be... You have to be born with the certain traits, certain qualities to be able to do that. For example, the rabbi could have done anything he wanted. Cannot do shape-shifting. But the person I'm talking about, she could. And when it comes to the holographic transformation, can anybody do that? Or do you have to be born with something? The only holographic I saw, it was on ETs. So I cannot tell you about humans. I don't know. It was ETs who became holographic, who became humans later. But I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. When it comes to extraterrestrial life, there's been, and there still is, a lot of thoughts in regards to these beings as evil, here to hurt us, here to kill us. They bring up the idea of reptilians and a lot of other races that are, they call them like fallen angels, part of the devil, evil. Have you ever experienced other than that threatening experience with the individual from Conan because you, he perceived you as a threat, have you ever been afraid and had a reason to be afraid when you were in contact with these extraterrestrials in an evil way? There's no such a thing. This is all nonsense. Stories that you hear on TV or whatever, there's no such thing. There is no evil. They are not evil. They don't know what evil is. I would even describe them as being extremely naive. Yeah, I was attacked because he thought I'm doing something bad to him. He was scared himself. It was my mistake. I shouldn't have done it. I just, I just decided because I'm curious to go and have a conversation with him or talk to him. And you know, I saw him as an animal, not as an entity. For me, it was an animal, a weird animal, and I was curious. I went to basically pet him and he attacked me. But do they have the power to attack? Yeah. Are they attacking? No. Absolutely not. They don't know what wars are. They do not have wars. There is no violence. There is only self-defense, just like in my case. But no, all the stories about evildoers and all that, this is only, unfortunately, on our planet. What would your response be to individuals who say that they've has had first-hand experiences with the reptilians who are drinking blood, extraterrestrial beings who are coming to kill you and eat you. No such a thing. Do you think that those people are just lying? 
Not necessarily, because there are humans who do that, and they can do it as a disguise of a reptilian, and they, under drugs, they can put you under the influence of drugs, and you are going to believe the story. I'm not telling you that they are lying, but it's either they are lying or somebody's lying to them, and it's a mind game, and there are a lot. Unfortunately, there are a lot of evil doers in this world. That's part of my disagreement with TLS. Like, how they allow things such as, in one way they do a lot of things like helping kids. I've been on missions underground with helping kids. We're talking about thousands and thousands of kids, but they don't seem to finish the job. And there are more kids, and there are more evildoers, and you need to take care of them. And the only way to take care of them, in my book, is to use violence, unfortunately. I'm not a violent person, but when you need to use violence, you've got to use violence in order to solve the problem. But they've done a lot, and sometimes TLS did use weapons or violence or stuff like that, but very rarely. So you've shared many times, and I've shared on your behalf, and in, in some ways on behalf of the organization as a whole, regarding certain operations that were done specifically throughout the year of 2020 with underground tunnels, an elaborate underground tunnel system run by very evil people, and many operations and missions having to do with rescuing or freeing children, as you like to say. A lot of people believe that the entities, the individuals who are operating in these underground tunnels are extraterrestrials who are very evil, doing terrible things to the human race. Now, you've been there many times, or you've been there a few times. Can you explain your experience down there, what it looks like, and if you've seen extraterrestrials or, or beings of other form down there at any point? There are no... There are no ETs down there. This is, again, stories from the media, maybe. No, it doesn't exist. It's unfortunately humans, evil humans, who are doing a lot of evil things. The children are only part of the issue. And yes, some were killed on our side. On their side. And thank God it was more on their side than our side. But yeah, some of my friends got killed on the missions. It was extremely dangerous. Those tunnels are protected with crazy technology by those evil doers. And you have to go with special shoes and special equipment. We did succeed in removing many many, many children. I'm not going to tell you the numbers. I'm talking a huge number. And it was done all over the world. I was more involved in the New York section of the job, but it was down in Australia. All over. Those tunnels are all over the world. For many, many years. Governments know about it. Governments know who the evildoers are. The evildoers are basically the people running the show. We do not have governments. This is all puppets, and I'm hoping that something good will happen soon, and somebody will be able to come and get rid of those people for good. And we can live in a new democracy, because right now there is no democracy. We are all sort of slaves in the system that we don't even understand. And children are being hurt. Money is being stolen from very naive people. Such as myself. And you. Also, it's like... They're basically running every part of our world. If it's the media, if it's the army, if... Anything you can think of. And I'm hoping that something soon will happen. And... When Corona started... I was hopeful, and I saw as an opportunity for someone to rise up. We need a good, strong leader that knows how to play the game. And you got, and again, in my opinion, you got a deal. You answer fire with fire, not with flowers. And I'm hoping this leader will come soon because we lost democracy a long time ago. It's not now. Democracy is gone. Slavery is very much in. People think slavery was abolished. No, it wasn't abolished. It's just changed its character. So we're going to think we live in a democracy. We're being poisoned systematically 
through our food, through our water, through the air, through the medicine that you're that they are giving you. And as I said, I'm hoping, I'm hoping for a true leader to rise up soon and lead us out of this mess. I have a more philosophical question for you. For mm -hmm. you and I disagree in many cases on how to deal with the situation. TLS disagrees with you as well. Yes. In regards to you believe that violence is necessary in many cases. And TLS says in some cases they will take down certain organizations and do their best without using force whenever they can not use force. But in most cases, from my understanding, they focus on awakening the people to stop this from happening further down the line. So my question for you is you're saying you believe that you have to fight fire with fire. And the way that I personally see it is that can only take you so far because sure, you can take out certain people in power doing terrible things, but what would stop them from being replaced? And in my eyes, it's if the masses don't change, if the people don't become more aware to what's going on in the world, then that will continue happening. And you could take out and execute whoever you want. It's not going to help you. So what's your stance on that alternative view of the situation? I'm a big believer in awareness. I'm not against it. I think what you're doing is great work. What TLS does is great work. I'm not against it, but I'm saying in addition to awareness, you've got to protect the masses, the people, the children. They don't know what's going on. And in order to do it, sometimes I'm not saying, you know, you've got to do certain type of violence. When I say violence, by the way, I don't mean that I'm going to take a gun and go on a mission. You don't have to use bombs and guns to complete this mission. There is what I call spiritual violence. I know it's hard to understand what I'm talking about, but I'm not talking... I never talked about taking guns and go and kill somebody. That, I think, is... No, I'm not talking about that. But you are... You can eliminate people, the evildoers, without guns. The system exists. The technique exists. I'm aware of it. I've done it. I, I, if I get a team of 10 people from TLS and I, and I spoke about it many times to the organization, I could, in a very short time, this world can be changed to, yeah, are people going to be, you want to call it eliminated or die? Yes, but I don't see a problem with that. You're talking about the evil individuals in power that are doing what they're doing to children, to the masses, and so on. Yes. Can you elaborate? Are you talking about inducing a heart attack, or what are you talking about? I can't talk to you about the technique, but I can tell you when I'm saying violence, or use the word violence, you're talking about guns and bombs. No. No, I need 10 people for my mission. I worked out a plan on my own. I presented it to my superiors. I was rejected. Why? I don't know. I don't get it. I don't know. That's part of my problem with the organization I'm having, especially with the past two years. What's happening around the world, and I see all the all the misery and the evil that's going on, and nobody does anything. Yeah, they did some missions that took some kids out, a lot of kids out, and they did change things in the world, in certain places of the world. Not in every place. But there are in... They have their opinion of, there is a process, a process that needs to take place. We cannot interfere, but sometimes they do interfere. That's what I don't get. Either you don't interfere at all, or you interfere all the time. You can't. But I don't understand. The system of decision making right now. I don't get it. Uh, I never did. And... I've been doing this for 11 years now. Do you believe it has anything to do with not infringing on the free will of people? Probably. And it makes sense, but the evildoers are doing the exact same thing. So how do you want to win if you're not going to strike back? That's what I'm trying to say. Nobody has free will today. About anything. If you think about it, you have to pay taxes, or you're going to jail. You're going to take a vaccine, or you can't go to a restaurant. You have to vaccinate your children with all kinds of drugs, and 
they cannot go to school. There is no freedom. It's a form of slavery. You've got to put a mask on in most places in the world. That's a form of slavery. They know masks don't work. It's not that they don't know. They know. It's like ridiculous, but it's a form of slavery. It's like, when they're putting a mask on you, you are the slave. You're going to shut the hell up. You're going to talk when we tell you to talk. And the world is not going to a good place right now unless something is going to happen soon. When it comes to TLS, there's a lot of, if I would call them like crazy things that are really going on in the world that even when you bring them up, there are many skeptics out there. The majority of the world will not believe what we're speaking about here. Of course. So maybe the people that are listening to this may, but the majority of humanity, I know you believe, is not ready for this information. Why do you think that's the case? Because they cannot comprehend this material. First of all, 99.9% .9 are non-believers, unless you're going to give them an actual proof. And even if you give them a proof, they will say, there's a trick here. There's some magic. So yeah, I was totally non-believer when it started. When I started with this, I didn't even understand what the hell is going on. I didn't believe in any of those things, but the world is not ready. Unfortunately, most of humanity are dumb, in my opinion. But I think it will change. I'm pretty sure it will change. The knowledge, the information I have and I've received, I think I talked to you about it before, is from now, we have about 170 years left, max, for this nirvana to come. It could be faster. I'm not a guy with a lot of patience. I don't want to wait 170 years. I want, I want it to happen in my lifetime. And I'm not getting any younger. So, it will happen soon. And the world needs help. Hopefully, it will be done soon. Do you believe that, probability-wise, it will happen in your lifetime? In my lifetime, no. In your lifetime, yes. We both know that TLS has the ability to physically show certain things to the world. Extraterrestrial beings, the ability to shapeshift, levitation, and, and many other things. Free energy, incredible technology. Why are they not putting that out right now? This is not a magic show. Come, I'll show you what I can do so you can believe me. I think the day will come that a leader, such as the rabbi, will rise up. He will show himself. He will show his abilities. I don't know how, but he will show. And this particular person can become a leader and take over. And look, I do believe in one world, one government, for the right reasons. I think we will have one world, one king or one prime minister, one president. Call it whatever you want, there will be no more army. You don't need an army, there will be no wars, there will be no borders. Everybody will be as one. You might need a police force to control domestic troubles, but the economy is going to shift to a better place. There will be transparency, and once you have transparency, everything will be in a much better place, including our own economy. Will it happen? I'm sure it will. Through my experience with TLS, yeah, I'm sure it will happen. Will it happen before 170 years? I'd like to believe so. Right now, a lot of people, when they hear one world government, they think about New World Order, the Illuminati, the Cabal, all these very evil things. How does what you just said differ from what they're trying to do? They want to do it in order to control the masses, to make you a slave, take over your belongings, take over your money, and get rid of banking. Changing the economy and basically make you into a slave so they can be in power. I'm not talking about a world like this. I'm talking about a world that everybody is one. Everybody has the same rights. Everybody could be rich or not rich. It's up to him. It's his decision. Free choice. Anybody can decide if he wants to take the vaccine or not vaccine. Everybody can decide what religion he wants to follow. If religion will even exist, I think religion will be abolished eventually. In order for my type of world to happen, religion has to be dismantled. And it will be. It would be maybe one religion. 
Call it love. Call it whatever you want. But it'll be one. So, be one world. One government. One king. One prime minister. Whatever you want to call it. And yeah, all you need is a small police force for just domestic problems. That's it. In a situation like that, I would say the biggest concern is what happens if that one prime minister, one king, one government becomes corrupt like we experience in the world today. This is why you have a democracy. You're not appointing him for life. There is a government in place, that government of the people, for the people, the way it was intended to be, not like what's happening today. You understand, today everybody does whatever he wants to do. Nobody cares about the small person. The average citizen is suffering, he's being robbed blind. They don't even know it. So in other words, this can only really happen when we collectively raise our awareness to one of more unity, caring, and loving for others as well. Sure, absolutely. And it will happen. Is this how the extraterrestrial planets live their life, those beings? Is this how they live their life on the planets you've been to? Absolutely. Can you explain a little bit? What that do they they don't have an army? Do they have a police force? Do they have a government? There's no army, there's no wars, cannot be wars. Even though there are different planets that can travel from one to another. Are there troubles there? Like I told you in Sia, they have water issues, so they they have a problem of surviving right now. So they have their own technique to get water. How long it's gonna last, I don't know, but it's definitely an issue. But wars no. There's no such a thing as wars. They don't know what wars are. They're... All of them are very calm. They're living, I would say, almost stress-free. They're all vegans. There is no such thing as animals to eat. They don't exist. And I'm waiting for this one-world government. Yes, but the way I described it not the way they're planning to do it today. When do you believe humanity here on Earth will be able or be willing to receive the information that you're sharing here with us with open arms? Unfortunately, I think that something tragic needs to happen in this world. It might be a war. I don't know what. And that will bring a lot of bloodshed. And I think only then, after a heavy body count, people will start opening their eyes. And at the same time, I'm hoping for this leader to show up and start taking over. And it could be done. It will be done. I know it will be done. I just don't know when, and I don't have the patience to wait. I want to do everything today I could. I want to do it next week if I can, and I know it can be done. It is a fight. It's not going to be pleasant, but it will be better than what we are experiencing today. When do you feel that full disclosure will occur with not just extraterrestrial life, but also with everything that you just spoke about on the collective level? When will it happen? You want me to give you a timeline? I know you can't say for sure. Do you think that there will be a massive change in one year, five years, 10 years, 30 years? Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime. Although I'd like, I know, I know it can be done. I'm sure it can be done, but nobody likes my way of doing things. So I can't do it on my own. I need, I need, uh, I need a team to deal with it. So the way we're going today, I think we're going to have to go through a hard process. We're already in it. To my opinion, we are in a third world war. Nobody's paying attention even. We are at war. People are going to die. People are going to get sick. But I don't think that 
in the next few years will be Nirvana. No. Nirvana will take more time, unfortunately. Although, again, somebody can wake up tomorrow and say, okay, let's do it. It could be done in a very, very short time. This world could be in a totally different place within 30 days. Totally different place. You have a lot of information in your hands and a lot of power, in my opinion, to make a change. But you still choose not to because of two reasons from my understanding. Number one, you don't feel people are ready. And number two, you don't want to disclose your identity for your own privacy concerns. When speaking about the magnitude of what you just spoke about, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but why do you feel that your privacy is more important than the potential to make even a little bit of a change to make it happen in your lifetime? Because I don't feel I have to reveal my private life in order to make it happen. It has nothing to do with it. You're talking about the book. That's what you're talking about. I'm talking about rays of light. I'm talking about certain experiences that you've had that you're allowed to share. I know that. And you don't want to because you're afraid that people may look at you differently. Not only that, I told you this before. TLS from day one pushed me to release the book. I'm against it for a few reasons. Number one, as you said, I have a lot of private things that I'm going to keep private. I don't see any reason for the world needs to know about my private life. That's one. Number two, I have to protect my children, my family, my good friends. There is a lot of people who are named in this book, but I have to conceal their names. And let's assume tomorrow I will give all this up and say, you know what, let's put it out there. TLS is not willing to give the code. Without the code, what is the purpose of the book? You can read it all you want. When you read it, you see a story. When I read it, there is no story. I see the codes. I can build something out of it. You can't. So why give the people something that they cannot really comprehend fully? Yeah, I'm sure they would love the book, every person. And there's not too many of them. Every person that's had the privilege privilege of reading this book, it was an experience. They all said, without knowing the code, they said, it was an unbelievable experience. It's a learning experience. It's a life experience. Everybody, okay, enjoyed it. And everybody learned something from it. But once you have the code, which is a very simple code, but you need to be taught the code, you're going to read it differently. Your understanding will be different. Major world secrets will come out to you and something like, if you have no idea what's going on, suddenly you see, wow, I see it differently now. So again, my, my problem with TLS, you're pushing me to release the book. Okay. Let's assume I'm agreeing. Okay. Maybe we could do a compromise and I hide the names like I did it with you not too long ago. So I'll hide the names, okay? But the real essence of this book is the code and they are not willing to release it. They're not saying never, they're saying not now. So when you're ready, then we will release it. Why release it now and give the code in 10 years? It just doesn't make sense. Well, 20 or 100 years, I don't know what they're planning to do now. Forget rays of light. There's other materials there that you are not aware of, that I know about them. Great information. That can go very well with rays of light. There is a specific book that will be ready to come out very soon. I wrote it myself. There's a part of it. It's in my writings. Information I had to put in. I was asked to work with a group of people. They are not willing to release it. You just said that it was coming out very soon. Coming out to TLS, I would be able to maybe read it. Not you. Not your viewers. They're not going to release it, so why do you want to release my information and not your information, which is part of me also? I happen to be part of it. Again, there are so many secrets. I have no clue. I don't know. I'm not. I don't know. Look, don't misunderstand me. It's a great organization. They are 
they have done and they're doing many, many great things. It's just this, these small things that drive me crazy every time. I have a great relationship with the organization. I love them all. I would give my life for these people. But I don't make the rules, so I gotta go with the flow. Whoever makes the rules has to make a decision, and it's not happening. Has it ever occurred to you that maybe there's a disclosure process in order to not hurt people or not give too much too soon to create chaos? And maybe they're saying, put out the book in its entirety, and something that you as Ray cannot necessarily foresee will come to fruition. In other words, have you learned to trust the system and work with it, or are you not there yet? It's not that I don't trust the system. I can't say that because I've seen what they're capable of doing. It's just, I don't think enough is being done. They have the power to do more. They are a very unique organization with a lot of power, with people, with a lot of power. They can do things in every level in this world, in this universe, but they choose not to. The main reason that I'm always being told, you cannot interfere with the process of destiny. Maybe the codes, at this point, would interfere with the process of destiny. Have you thought about that? For sure, but it will change the world. But you're changing the world inorganically. No. I'm just giving you the secrets that only a few know. And there are more secrets that I don't know that they can give you also. So why not bring it to a better world? Because you just said that if you reveal certain secrets at the wrong time, it could be infringing on somebody's free will. And maybe the process of putting the book out in the way that it needs to be put out without the codes would be one step closer to getting the codes to allow all of us as a human race and as life to go through this process organically instead of forcefully by giving us something that we didn't work to achieve. No, it will not change somebody's free will. It will, it will cause somebody to rethink their choices. That's different. I'm not changing your freedom to choose. I'm giving you an opportunity. I said, before you make a decision, before you make a choice, read this. There's much more to this world than what you think. After you've read it, whatever you choose, I'm with you. Of course, they would choose differently because the book with the code will change them forever. But that's the idea. It's a good thing, it's not negative. There's one portion in the text itself that was just released to the world where the rabbi said something to you, and I'm going to paraphrase it. He said, if I gave you all the secrets to the universe without you working to receive those secrets and you working to, to get what you're receiving, then your choice will no longer be a free choice. It will be a biased choice. Yes, and I agree. Might be right, however... Can you really sit here and tell me that the entire world, 8 billion people, are subject to change? No. Not going to happen. Well, to be fair, 8 billion people have been changing every day. Look at the world 10 years ago. Look at the world today. Look at our eating habits. Look at what we are doing. Sure, tragedy causes that, but people have changed from 10 years ago, 50 years ago, and 100 years ago. They changed negatively. I'm talking about a positive move into awareness. Once you have the awareness, you know what's going on. Obviously, you're going to react differently and act differently. You're going to speak differently. You're going to look at your family differently. Everything will be different. Th this awareness can give you some internal powers that you're not tapped into right now. For example, you might get to a point where you will be able to see past incarnations. That's a great thing if you use it for the proper purpose, and that's not what's happening here. Yes, the rabbi, you're really expecting that most of the world, like I told you before, unfortunately, I know it sounds bad when I'm saying 95% are dumb, they aren't going to change. So if you want to be like the evildoers who are talking about deleting some of the population because they are not necessary for this world. You don't take a 80-year-old woman and kill her because she's not useful to society anymore. By the way, she could be extremely useful to society if society knew how to deal with an 80-year-old woman. This is something we all forget. 
We do not know how to do it. But if you think an average 80-year-old woman or man, they have a lot of experience in life that we can learn from. They have knowledge that we don't have. They have memories from 70 and 80 years ago that we don't know about. There's a lot to learn here. There's a lot to do, but we lost respect for our elders. We see them as a problem. Therefore, you know what, if you are 65, 70, you might as well die. So much the population. Tomorrow there's going to be too many Jews, too many black people, too many Spanish people. The Aryan race, the way Hitler did it. That's what these psychopaths are going to do, and the people don't understand it. Now, the rabbi, with all due respect, he wants to change things. But he wants to do it through the process. I don't have time to wait for the process. People are dying every day. They're being murdered. People are being murdered. And nobody does anything about it. To me, it's wrong. Do you believe that the world right now is ready for true awareness? Complete awareness. No, but you know what? Let's assume complete awareness will be open to the public. Okay? Some people are going to take it in a very bad way. They can commit suicide. I'm not telling you no. It's their choice. Some people might get a heart attack from excitement. It's their choice. This is the destiny of the soul. They decided to change according to what happens now. Yes. Is this information going to change your choices? Yes, but I'm not interfering with their choices. They can still decide whatever they want, not stopping them. I'm not forcing them, not putting a gun to their head. I'm telling you, listen, this is the information. Check if it's true, if it makes sense to you, and move on. Most people will make the right change. A lot of people, I don't think it's a big percentage, will not. They may die, yes. Let them die. So what? That's part of the process. They'll die, they'll reincarnate. I don't know what's going to happen, but it's not like murder like happening today. They're murdering people. And you see smart, intelligent people, and you... You know, on a day-to-day, -day, I meet people through my business, you know, normal people, smart, intelligent. And I'm sitting and I'm talking to them to see if I can get somewhere. No. They are so blind. They don't see anything. They don't see anything. How do you think you change that? Is it your job to change it? That may be a better question. No, it's not my job. My job is more on an individual basis. I don't think... I don't think there's a way to change it without shocking the world somehow. How do you shock the world? You do a team effort. And you neutralize the people you want to neutralize at the same time. You bring people like you to send awareness. And at the same time, you release information. Such as the different books we talked about. And today, the world of internet you could send information in two seconds to everybody in this world. And yeah, again, most people will see it as a positive. Will act positively. Yeah, there's some who might do the exact opposite. It's their choice. Like, if they'll die because of it, it's their choice. I didn't push them. I didn't force them. I didn't. I told them, listen, do whatever you want. You don't have free choice today. None of us. None of us. My last question for you is, at this point, I mean, you've seen a lot throughout, especially the past 11 years and in your life as a whole. But with everything you've seen, with everything you've experienced, with everything that you've learned and gone through and accessed and, and everything in between, what would be the message that you would give to humanity right now to both the skeptics and the believers to help encourage us to go in the right direction? Most of the information that we have in this world today have is mostly false information. We live in a world of lies, manipulation. And I think I like to ask people is to wake up. We are all sleeping. Stop listening to the news. Stop listening to this major media. 
There's research you could do out there and get better information. Educate yourself about your economy, about your health system, about your vaccines, about your taxes. Everything you are being fed, I can tell you, is a lie. We are being misled. Our children are being misled. The education our kids are getting today is, like, ridiculous, and and we are being fed with a bunch of lies. Our job as citizens, as private citizens, is to try to get to the truth through research, to learn. So stop watching Monday Night Football and use your time for something more meaningful. Search your inner soul. Search for the inner soul of your friends, your family. Search for the right information. There's a lot of good people out there. There's a lot of good leaders. Maybe not as strong as I would like them to be, but they're good leaders. Start opening your eyes and your hearts to learn something new. Because we are not going to a good place and I am worried in a way. And I think we could do much better. But it has to be a team effort. We, as you said many times to your viewers, we have to act as one. And we don't have to agree on every opinion or whatever. It's okay to disagree. As long as we work together to a common goal of a better life. Freedom, liberty, pursuit of happiness doesn't exist. We have to bring democracy back. Maybe the Democrats are in power right now, but there is no democracy. It's all lies. Thank you very much. And thank you for, for again, giving us your time and agreeing to do this. I know it wasn't easy for you and there was a lot of convincing in the process, but thank you for coming, even though it's a different voice and we can't see you. I know that you do care for everybody and you care for the right thing and you have your own ways of doing it and they're definitely unique. But I really do appreciate you coming and, and sharing your experiences and your thoughts and your insights and your knowledge with all of us today. Thank you.